Chapter Ten of Kitty Alone by Sabine Baring Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Ten: The New Schoolmaster. One day, when her uncle was at home busy about his accounts, which engaged him frequently without greatly enlightening him, but serving rather to involve his mind in confusion, Kate was assisting her aunt in preparing for the early dinner when a tap at the door announced a caller. Pasco shouted to the person outside to come in, and a young man entered, tall, with fair hair and clear, steady gray eyes. "'I'm the new schoolmaster,' he said frankly. "'I have thought it my duty to come and see you, as you are the church warden and one of the managers of the national school.' "'Quite right. Sit down. I have been busy. I am a man of the commercial world. This is our meal-time. I am disengaged from my accounts.' You can sit and eat, and we will converse whilst eating. Mrs. Pepperwell entered, and her hard eye rested on the young man. The new schoolmaster, she said. Do you come from these parts? No, I am a stranger to this portion of England. That's a misfortune. If you could be born again, and in the West Country, it would be a mercy for you. From where do you come? From Hampshire. That's right up in the north. The schoolmaster raised his eyebrows. Of course, in the south of England. It doesn't follow, said Zara. By your speech, I took you to be foreign. And what may your name be, said Pasco, if I may be so bold as to ask. I have heard it, but it sounded French, and I couldn't recollect it. My name is very English. Walter Bramber. Never heard anyone so called before. Brambles and Bramptons and Branscombe's. It don't sound English to our ears. I may as well tell you, sit down and take a fork, that we liked our last schoolmaster uncommon much. He was just the right sort of man for us, but the rector took against him. I thought he was rather given to the, well, what of that? We have, all of us, our failings. A trout is an uncommon good fish, but it has bones like needles, you have your failings. My wife has hers. I will say this for Mr. Solomon Puttycomb. He never got tight in our parish. When he was out for a spree, he went elsewhere, to Newton, or Tymouth, and sometimes to Ashburton. He couldn't help it. Some folks have fits. Others have bilious attacks. When he wasn't bad, he was very good. The children liked him. The parents liked him. I liked him, and I'm the church warden. He had means of his own, besides the school pence and his salary. A man has a right to spend his money as he chooses. If he had got tight on the school pence, I can understand that there might have been some kind of objection. But when it was his own private means, then I don't see that we have anything to do with it. Have you means of your own? I am sorry to say, none. We always respect those who have means. If you have none... Of course you can't go on the spree anywhere, and oughtn't to do so. It would be wrong and immoral. Take my advice, and call on the old schoolmaster. The parish will be pleased, as it has been terribly put out at the rector giving him his dismissal. But I thought there had been an unhappy scandal, that, in fact, he had been committed to— Well, well, he was locked up. There was a cockfight somewhere up-country— not in this country, but at a place called Waterloo. There is no such place in England, said Bramber. Waterloo is in Belgium. It lies about five miles from Brussels. You are a schoolmaster, and ought to know. But of this I am quite sure. It was in England where he got into trouble, and the name of the place was Waterloo. He may have been at some inn called the Waterloo, but positively there is no place in England so designated, said Mr. Bramber. I know very well the place was Waterloo, and that Mr. Solomon Puttycomb got into trouble there. We all are liable to troubles. I have lost my daughter. Troubles are sent us. The parson himself has said so. Puttycomb got locked up. You see, cockfighting is a pursuit to which he was always very partial. You go and call on him, and he'll sing you his song. It begins, Come all you cockfighters from far and near. I'll sing you a cock-match when and where, on Aspirin Moor, as I've heard say, 
a charcoal black and a bonny bonny grey. That is how the song begins, but it is about another cockfight, not at Waterloo. Cockfighting is Mr. Puddicombe's pursuit. We have all got our pursuits, and why not? There's a man just outside Newton is wonderful hot upon flowers. His garden is a picture. He makes it blaze with various kinds of the finest colored, foreign and English plants. That's his pursuit. And then there is a doctor at Tymouth who goes out with a net catching butterflies, and he puts ale and treacle on the trees in the evening for catching moths. That's his pursuit. And our parson likes dabbling with a brush and some paints. That's his pursuit. And business is mine. That's my pursuit and my pleasure. And it's profit, too. Sometimes, not often, threw in Zara. Well, I don't know what your pursuits be, Mr. Schoolmaster, said Pepperill. Let's hope they're innocent as those of Mr. Puddicombe. The young man glanced around him, staggered at his reception, and caught the eye of Kate. She was looking at him intently, and in her look were both interest and pity. "'We won't argue any more,' said Pasco. "'I suppose you can eat starry gazy pie?' "'I am ashamed to say I never heard of it.' "'Never heard of it? And you said to teach our children. "'Sarah, tell Mr. Schoolmaster what starry gazy pie is.' There is nothing to tell, said Zara ungraciously. It was her way to be ungracious in all that she said and all she did. It is fish pie, herrings and pilchards, with their heads out of the crust looking upwards. That is what they call stargazing in the fishes, and, in short, starry gazy pie. But if you don't like it, then there is our old stag coming on presently. Do you know, I shall have made two experiences today that are quite new to me, in the first place I shall make acquaintance with starry gazy pie, that promises to be excellent, and in the next place I may add that it has never been my luck hitherto to taste venison. "'What's that?' asked Mrs. Pepperwell sharply. She thought Bramber was poking fun at her. "'I have never had the chance before of tasting venison, the meat of the rich man's table.' "'No means, you know,' said Pasco. "'Without private means you can't expect to eat chicken.' "'Our old stag is hardly chicken,' said Zara. "'You see, now we've got a young stag, "'we don't want the old one any more.' "'Solomon Puttycomb married my second cousin,' "'observed Pepperell. "'Her name was Eastlake. "'Are you single?' "'Yes, that is my forlorn condition. "'Well, look sharp and marry into the parish. "'It's your only chance. "'You see, the farmers are all against you. "'They were partial to Puttycomb.' and I hear he is intending to set up a private school. The farmers and better class folk will send their children to him. They don't approve of their sons and daughters associating with the laborers' children, though they did send some to the national school, as long as Solomon Puttycomb was there. But that was because he was so greatly respected. Do you mean to say that Mr. Puttycomb is still in Cum and Tynod? Certainly. When he returned from Waterloo, as the place was called where was that cockfight, and he got into some sort of difficulty, he came back to his own house. He got it through his wife, who was in Eastlake, my cousin. It is his own now, and he has private means, so he intends setting up a school. It will be very select. Only well-to-do parents' children will be admitted. When they let Mr. Puttycomb out of jail at Waterloo, which is somewhere in the Midlands, leastways in England, then the people here were for ringing appeal to welcome him home. The parson put the keys in his pocket and went off. They came to me. I am churchwarden, and I knocked open the belfry door. We gave Puttycombe a peal, and the rector wasn't overpleased. I am churchwarden, and that is something. You see, Mr. Puttycombe has means, and a house he got through my cousin Eastlake. I don't know how the school will be kept up now that the rector has had Puttycombe turned out of it. None of the farmers will subscribe. We have no resident squire. He will have to make up your salary out of his own pocket. He is not married, so he can well afford it. If he don't consult our feelings, I don't see why we should consider his pocket. None of us wished to lose Solomon Puttycomb. Everyone trusted him, and he was greatly respected. Again the schoolmaster looked round him. A sense of helplessness had come over him. Again his eye encountered that of Kate, and he instinctively understood that this girl felt for him in his difficulties and humiliation, 
and understood how trying his position was. "'Now for a bit of our old stag,' said Pasco. "'Stag!' exclaimed Bramber. "'That is foul.' "'What you call foul is stag to us. "'He crowed till his voice cracked. "'He may be tough because old, but he's been long boiling.' "'Oh, a cock!' "'Bramber learned that day that a cock in Devonshire is entitled stag. "'The meal ended. Pasco Pepperell stood up and said, "'Mr. What's-your-name, I dare say you will like to look over my stores. "'You'll be wanting coals, and I sell coals by the bushel. "'You drink cider, I dare say. "'I can provide you with a hogshead, or half, if that will do. "'If you want to do shopping, I speak against my interests.' but Whiteaway deals in groceries. You'll find his shop up the street. If there be anything he hasn't got, and you need to go into Tymouth, why, that is the ferry, and we charge a penny to put you across, and it's a penny back. If you desire to be polite to friends, and would like to entertain them, there are cockles and winkles, tea or coffee, to be had here, sixpence a head. But if the number were over twenty, we might come to an arrangement at fourpence halfpenny. And if you desire a conveyance at any time, I have a cob and a trap that I let out at a shilling a mile, and something for the driver. And if you smoke and drink, I have, I mean, I dare say I could provide for you tobacco and spirits that you, you know, haven't seen the customs and are accordingly cheap. And if you should happen to know of a timber merchant who wants a lot of oak, I've dropped over a hundred pounds on some prime stuff I shall sell only to such as no good oak from bad. And if you've any friends in the weaving trade, I do some business in wool, and am getting first-class fleeces from Dartmoor. If you can oblige me in any way like this, well, I dare say I shan't be so prejudiced for Mr. Puddlecombe. Pascal Pepperell conducted the schoolmaster about his premises in an ostentatious manner, showed him his stores, his stable, the platform on which tea and coffee, winkles and cockles were served. He named the prices he had paid, and gave the newcomer to understand that he was a man who had plenty of money at his disposal. Then an idea occurred to Pasco. Perhaps the schoolmaster might help him with his accounts. He himself could not disentangle them and balance his books. He was shy of letting anyone else see them, but this Bramber was a complete stranger, a man whom he could reduce to dependence on himself. He had no private means, no friends in the place. He had given the man a dinner, and might make of him a very serviceable slave. "'Look here,' said Pepperell, in a haughty tone. "'Mr. Schoolmaster, I suppose you know something of accounts and bookkeeping?' "'Certainly I do. I shouldn't mind now and then paying you a trifle, giving you a meal, and favoring you with my support. I am churchwarden, and consequently on the committee of the National School. Me and the bishop, and the archdeacon and rector, and Whiteaway as well.' I mean, I'll stand at your back, if you will oblige me now and then, and hold your tongue. I will do anything I can to oblige you, said Bramber. And as to holding my tongue, what is it you desire of me? Merely to help me with my accounts. My time is so occupied, and I do business in so many ways, that my books get somewhat puzzling. I mean to a man who is taken up with business. I am entirely at your service. But... You understand, I don't want my affairs talked about. People say I have plenty of money, that I'm a man who picks it up everywhere, but I don't desire that they should know how much I have, and what my speculations are, and what they bring in. I can hold my tongue. Would you look at my books now? Certainly. Accordingly, Walter Bramber re-entered the house, and was given the books in a private sitting-room, and worked away at them for a couple of hours. The confusion was great. Pepperell might have had a genius for business, but this was not manifest in his books. Presently Pasco came in. Well, said he, make em out, eh? You must excuse my saying it, said Bramber, but if these are all, your affairs are in a very unsatisfactory condition. Unsatisfactory? Oh, pfft! Of course, I have other resources. There's the Brimps Forest of Oaks. There's, oh, lots. Winkles and cockles, tea and coffee not entered. Sixpence a head, over twenty, fourpence halfpenny, said Walter Bramber dryly. Oh, lots. Lots of other things. I haven't entered all. 
I sincerely hope it is so. It is so, on my word. Because you seem to me to be losing seriously on every count. Losing? You don't know creditor from debtor count. That comes from education. It's never of use. Nothing like business for teaching a man. I don't believe in your book learning. I'll come again tomorrow and go more carefully into the accounts. Oh, thank you. Not necessary. It is clear to me you do not understand my system and mistake sides. Pasco became red and angry. Look here, Mr. Schoolmaster. Let me give you a word. You don't belong to the laborers. You won't be able to make friends of them. You don't belong to the gentry. There are none here, so you need not think of their society. You don't belong to the middle class. You are not a farmer, or a tradesman, or a merchant, so they will have nothing to do with you. You make my accounts all right, and the balance on the right side. Give up your foolish bookkeeping as learned in college, and set my accounts right by common sense, and I'll see what I can do to get you taken up by some respectable people. And, one thing more, don't go contradicting men of property, and saying that there is no cockfighting at Waterloo, because there was, and people don't like contradictions. When I broke open the belfry door that the ringers might give Mr. Puttacomb a peal, I let the world see I wasn't going to be priest-ridden, and we are not going to be schoolmaster-ridden neither, and told our accounts are wrong, and that Waterloo, where the cockfight was, is not in England. End of chapter 10